In this episode, we take a look at the track work as well as research the Hiawatha Elevated District. We assemble the bench work and take a look at what we can do to modify a crossover. And I mentioned in the previous episode about how I can make this uh, kind of a more unique uh, crossover. Real fan, the BNSF, and of course, go back in time to find out this is what the 80s looked like? Also check out what the curmudgeon's gripe of the week is this week. Only in this episode of Sue the Milwaukee Road. As research is really never ending, I end up going down to South Minneapolis to be able to take a look at some of the structures as well as track work. Here we're looking at the Minneapolis Seed Company. It's Cargill in my area. You can even see where the sign was originally located at the end of the building. Here we're actually looking north towards Minneapolis. Now we're taking a look south. What you have on the left-hand side is the elevator T. On the right-hand side is the Nokomis elevator. Here we've scurried down to 37th Street to take a look at the General Mills elevator as well as the ADM Atkinson elevator. One thing about laying out the actual track plan, I did end up acquiring a map and it is a treasure map. To be able to use a map like this to work with selective compression, I end up selecting the routes that I want to be able to model and use on the railroad. Now there are some redundancies and a few things just from a scale standpoint that I was able to eliminate. One of the biggest hurdles I ran into is the room itself. I had to bend 90 degrees and well, this is the solution I ended up coming up with. I'm going to work on the south end today. We are looking across 37th Street heading south. General Mills on the left, Adium Atkins on the right. We're going to take a look at wrapping up the bench work as well as some of the wiring and electrical. Hey, look at here, the old pussy. Cat is back. <laughs> you didn't think I was really going to disappear, did you? What I'm talking about here is not wrapping in your own sandbox. Just make sure that if you're going to be at somebody's place and you're looking at the railroad, eh, sometimes it's better to just keep your old crap to yourself. You know what I mean? You know, you're taking a dump in somebody else's sandbox. Well, it's going to be kind of sneaky. It's not going to be cool, you know. So pay attention to what you're saying. Let's just say, you know, you're going to observe and you can kind of go, ooh, boy. <laughs> say it later. Say it in the car. Don't say it when you're there. Don't say it to the owner unless they ask. You think my railroad looks like crap? Pussy's out. All right, we're picking up where we left off, and that was putting the supports underneath the southern end of the Hiawatha Elevated District. I end up using pocket screws, and you ask, what are pocket screws? Well, it's just a way to attach a support brace without showing the exterior screws shot through the outside of the bench work. I end up being pretty happy with the way the, uh, the whole system ended up being tied together. As you can see here, pocket screws in place, and now it's time to move on to other aesthetics and that is actually the side of the railroad. I end up running the entire top portion of the railroad through the table saw, and that actually is just to clean up the edge of the railroad. You say, what is the point of that? Well, again, aesthetics. Have you ever seen color mark on the side of a Sioux Line freight car and wondered, oh, when did that start? Was it A, 1954? B, 1963? Was it C, 1974? Or D, 1986? We'll check out the answer later in this episode. All right, we're taking a look at a crossover, and I mentioned in a previous episode about how I can make this uh, kind of a more unique uh, crossover. We'll look forward to um, the possibility of what I do with track work and how I uh, end up actually modifying the switches to be able to work in, uh, I guess, a real nice, unique way. And the way I've gone about doing that is I've eliminated any rail joiners. As you can see here, it's a solid rail all the way through up into the point. There's a little bit of an insulator there, but that's, uh, that's installed and designed on the turnout itself. So what I'm actually going to do in this particular instance is just slide one turnout into another. And I do that by simply pulling this rail out, and I pull this rail out. There is a little contact on the underside of these that are holding on to that particular piece of rail. So I just disconnect that and I can just pull that out using my, uh, my rail nips. And then I cut a few ties back on both of these and then I slide these together and I've got myself a consistent crossover. Now I've already done all my crossovers. I don't have an example to be able to do that on, but those are the steps that I took. And that allows you then to have this nice smooth continuity from the one rail right into the point. And why do you go about doing this? Well, one, it eliminates having that rail joiner that might be gaudy and, and sticking up in an area. 
this just gives you a more streamlined turnout. This is what I'm doing on this particular uh, instance, and uh, hopefully it helps some of you in the future with uh, laying out crossovers. Did you run and grab your Sue Mag to look the answer up? Of course I did. You find that answer and say P1963 because you'd be correct. It was equipped with load protectors, cushioned underframe, and adjustable bulkheads, insulation, custom dunnage, and pneumatic unloading. Those are all color mark features. Well, color me Sue crazy because I had no idea. Here we are in the modern day rail fanning the BNSF. Looking across the way is the CP Rail, former Sioux Lines Shoreham Yard. We're just going to let you kick back and listen to these guys rumble by. wondering about that track in the foreground it is actually a connecting track that will if you're looking south here eventually work its way back into the main line but if you work your way north you can swing west towards Humboldt Yard it takes you across the Camden Bridge that is uh, Sioux Line or CP train moves by at this pace for about 10 minutes and yes it does get old this location is known as university it's just south of university avenue you're looking at shoreham on the map and then you've got north town yard and if we pull all the way out that's where we are in the state Fun fact about the trailing car with the Fred, well, that graffiti was on there in 2011. It hasn't gone anywhere and nothing more has been added. Which is kind of nice. Ooh, here's a 10 second tip. Are you tired of dead batteries thanks to Digitrax? Well, cut a slit in the back panel. Use a piece of styrene to be able to insulate it when you're not using the throttle. Well, as some of you guys know, uh, I've gotten a little bit older. I had a birthday this past weekend. I just turned 40. And, well, <laughs> I've aged a little bit, as you can see. I just want to give a, a special thanks to a few fellow modelers. But before I do, I can't quite decide. Do I look like Biff Tannen or Lee Thompson? I think you could uh, try to decide for yourself. I want to give a special thanks to Edwin for the Historical Society cars. They're going to work great on the Hiawatha Elevator District. As well as Kurt for the Safety Award. 1985. I was five years old. Doesn't seem like that long ago, but boy, you look at me now and I'm definitely aging. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care. Rail fanning with Rivard to go. In the Hiawatha Elevator District. A locomotive rides like it's had a couple of wobbly pops. I'm going to let you listen to the e-bell and watch these guys cross and talk about the cars as they pass by. Hey, can you back out of the shot? Seriously. If you're modeling the prototype, you can find most of these models. An example here is the MP15 AC made by Atherm Genesis. We'll take a look at the cars that are in this cut as well as the manufacturers that make the particular models. For example, this 20-year-old car, it's made by Xactrail. It is a 4427 hopper. And here we have a 4600 cubic foot hopper made by Athum Genesis. This particular paint scheme is not the same as the prototype, but hopefully they'll do that one in the near future. We do have an undecked car here. This is a Tangent 4750, which would replicate that car that just rolled by. We are looking at a Sioux Line Historical Society 4650 made by Atlas. 
Where are they now? Here's a shot of this car in 2017, and here it is in 1986. If you're looking for it in a model form, the Intermountain 4750 will do. And speaking of 4750s, Tangent also did a 4750 in this particular paint scheme. It's a really sharp looking model, not to say the Intermountains aren't. They definitely stand in for what they are. We have a Sioux line version of this, again, in the Intermountain. We're going to look at one last car, and that's this Wisconsin Central car that's coming up. Walters did this one in this particular paint scheme, but Athern actually did these cars in a real refined version in the paint scheme that you see here. Well, hopefully you enjoyed that little review. That's all we've got for this particular cut of cars. Hey, uh, why well, we got some time to kill here? Uh, doesn't this guy here look like uh, Chris Dahlquist? Oh, crap, he responded. I think he just turned the radio off. Doesn't want to listen to us chatter anyway. Eh? Doug Smail. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah, you do look like Doug Smail. It's the sweet stash. Uh, yeah, the uh, the flannel and the uh, camouflage hat, though, uh, that, uh, that also screams 80s, eh? 80s. Now, if you want to talk partner in crime, check out this look. You got the billboard hat, sweet glasses, and what could be cooler? Oh, yeah, that arm hang. One last look at Cargill before these guys work their way south and we wrap this up. Because that's all for now, until the next episode. Alright, the curmudgeon's coming at you for the crap of the week. This week it's reliability in your track work. We're talking right now to make sure that your track work is bulletproof and reliable. There's nothing more frustrating than somebody coming along and saying, hey, I'm going to come over to your house and I'm going to operate. And the next thing you know, things are derailing. Oh, that never happens. Never happens. That's the beauty of having a test session, making sure that things are working. The more bulletproof your track work is, then you can move on to your detailing, your scenery, your ballast. And that's all for the curmudgeon's crap of the week. Oh, that never happens! Never happens! A big thanks to everybody that watches to the end that has hit like, hit subscribe, as well as made comments in the past. It's those actions that help share this content, so if you haven't checked out other episodes, feel free to do so. You can also check out the tour of the GN in 1970, as well as the past episodes of the GN in 1970. 70s. Oh, that never happens! Never happens! Oh, no.